Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. To use Squad Help and launch a naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. This is season two of How Brands Are Built. The first season was all about brand naming, so if that's something that interests you, you can go back and listen to those episodes and check the blog for some articles I've written about what I learned talking to all those naming experts. Season two is all about brand positioning, and on today's episode, I'm so excited to be speaking with the one and only Marty Neumeyer. Marty has authored some of the most popular books about branding, including The Brand Gap and Zag, which was named one of the 100 best business books of all time. He's also Director of Transformation at Liquid Agency, a Silicon Valley-based design firm. Marty and I talked about his newest book, Scramble, which is a fictional account of a CEO and his leadership team using what Marty calls agile strategy to build a brand and save a company in just five weeks. I also asked Marty plenty of questions about how he approaches brand strategy and brand positioning in general. And as you'd expect from his books, Marty's answers are thoughtful, crystal clear, and powerful in their simplicity. I hope you find this conversation as interesting as I did. Here it is. Marty Neumeyer, thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. I posted a question on social media just the other day. What's your favorite book about branding? And of course, whenever anybody asks that, people are going to mention some of your best-selling books, Brand Gap, Zag. But you just wrote a new book called Scramble and you decided to do something a bit different and write a business thriller. So my first question is just what is a business thriller and what inspired you to write uh, that format this time around? Well, you know, uh, The Brand Gap and um, and Zag are written in a, a format, uh, presented in a format that I'm calling a whiteboard overview. So it's super simplified, compressed information, uh, f- you know, framed in a really memorable way with uh illustrations and just it's very lively and it's about probably a third of the length of a normal business book um in yeah. in terms of words so and thank so, you and, for that <laughs> <It's a relief. laughs> you're welcome uh, and it's been successful and keep coming back to it and find deeper and deeper meanings and you can use those illustrations and charts so i'm i will probably use that format again in the future but with this subject, uh, agile strategy, it's um, a lot about collaboration and how you get disparate people with different with different uh, uh, skill sets to work together, mm-hmm. um, and just giving people a, a list of you know things to do or things to remember doesn't really capture the full uh, excitement, let's say, of the, to use a, the most positive term of, of, of <laughs> working together on yeah, chaos <laughs> of working together under pressure, under deadline pressure. So I wanted to capture that with this book. And the, t- to me, it just became really obvious, um, uh, that I had to, to write it, in, write it in the form of a story. Um, so I could, you know, deal with, realistic characters and and talk about the emotions the the nuance the difficulty of collaboration and so forth uh so that's why i did it so those who aren't familiar with the book it's a fictional account of a leadership team at i guess what you'd call a hospitality company called big sky Um, and i won't go deep into the plot but they end up using agile strategy as you said and that is really sort of the core of the book so what is agile strategy Agile strategy is a faster way of working through collaboration uh, and des- using design thinking as part of the process. So instead of working in um, the traditional manner, which would be I would describe as linear, mm-hmm. where decisions flow f- down from the top, you know, the CEO says, uh, you know, the board of directors says we've got to do, do X, you know, we have to come out with a new product, we have to increase revenues, whatever it is, and gives the order to do something and the orders roll downhill. and Every time um, it reaches a different level, a lower level or a different level, um, th- the the door is closed. That that decision is sealed. Right. It's sort and of so, a stage gate approach to strategy. It's a stage gate. Exactly. So it's and, and so if someone down the line says, hey, I have a better idea. Um, it's too late. You know, why are we making another SUV? You know, um, <laughs> I have a better idea. Uh, it's too late. 
it's not going to happen. So um, it's much better to get everybody working at the same time in the beginning and probably throughout the process and sharing ideas on, on the way. And that becomes pretty chaotic, uh, nerve wracking, but it, the results are terrific. And um, it speeds up the process, I don't know, five or 10 times. I mean, it's just amazing. And so- And you've broken Agile strategy down into five, what you call the five Qs and the five Ps. So the questions, the Qs are questions of strategy. What's our purpose? Who do we serve? Where should we compete? And then the five P's of design thinking, which we can get to in a minute. But I'm curious, you, you also included exercise for each of those five Q's in the book. Are these exercises in the book, are, are they the only ways to answer those questions or are they the, the best ways to answer those questions? Um, well, the short answer is no, they're not the only way. Um, I'm always experimenting. and um, But the ones that, that I'm presenting are kind of, um, I would say that they proved to be durable and um, and possibly even evergreen. So I've presented the ones that are kind of foolproof, the ones that I always go to, my go-to exercises. But, you know, I'm always learning about new ways of doing things. And when I work with different groups, they bring ideas in. And um, sometimes I'm skeptical and I'm proven wrong. Like, you know, we um, the people I work with most, my company, Liquid Agency, they like to do a, uh, an exercise uh, in um, – insert uh, personality types for, for brands right. and there's 12 types. And I thought, well, it's kind of, you know, fluffy thinking, but boy, does it work in a group situation? People love it. <laughs> and, um, the archetypes like the, the archetypes. young archetypes. Got it. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people use those I, and I've always been skeptical, but I'm Me a too. total believer <laughs> in the, in the situation of a, of a workshop where you've got a lot of people that are nervous about it. Um, feeling like a fish out of water and suddenly you give them something like that. And they, they latch onto it and they can identify the traits of their company. And then we've got something to, to refer back to. And you mentioned liquid. So is agile strategy now, whether uh, you can speak for yourself or for liquid as a whole, but is agile strategy kind of your default approach to new projects or does it only work in certain situations or certain types of clients? Um, we use variations of it depending on um, the client, the situation, the the mission that we're on. <clears throat> so we might use part of it or all of it or some variation that that um, that works better. Or depending on who's leading the workshop, they may say, well, I, I want to do it slightly differently. But the elements are swirling around in all those workshops. So I've just tried to sort of make it really simple. If you need a formula, this would be my formula. Right. Um, it's the one it's the one I like to use when I'm doing the what I call the full Marty, <laughs> <laughs> really going into the whole thing and like doing a big number on the company. Um, but sometimes it can be a lot quicker than that. And you don't need all of these questions and you don't need all of the uh, the principles of, of, of design thinking. So so, you know, you have to be flexible. But I'm, I'm trying to present kind of a, a standardized way of doing it that anybody can see value in. And, and in the book, is it so are you saying it's sort of an idealized version? How much did you try to make it realistic versus trying to demonstrate or, or depict a perfect example of how it could work? Well, in the book, it isn't perfect. Right. Um, there's a lot of people are bumping into each other. There's emotions are flaring. Um, you can see how it, how difficult this is when you're trying to work with people in a group and they all have they're coming from a different point of view and a different experience space you know so that's what the book is about it's showing this is what we're trying to do however <laughs> you know it's not easy and um you're gonna have to be flexible and human and empathetic and all these other things which most business books don't go into do right. they They just say here's how you do it and then you're left to find out that hey it's harder than it seems yeah i really enjoyed how it allows you to give kind of the blueprint or the schematics of a process, but then it also gets into the emotional context of delivering on that process, which is so much of what brand consulting and I imagine any kind of consulting is. It's dealing with egos, dealing with personalities in the room. And so, and you're right, there's, there's, I've never read anything that really helps, helps you understand how to deal with that uh, in real time. But this book by telling it in story form kind of gets into that. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of it. I, I really enjoyed how that that worked out. And one of the aspects of agile strategy we mentioned a minute ago is design thinking, uh, which you break down again into those five P's problemizing, pinballing, probing, prototyping and proofing. 
how do, what's your definition of design thinking and if you could explain how it relates to agile strategy? Yeah, I think the simplest way to define design thinking is to to think of it in comparison to uh, traditional decision making. Mm-hmm. So uh, in a traditional business setting, decision making is a, a two step process. You know something and you go directly from knowing something or thinking you know something to doing something. So you know something because you've you had it in at Harvard, you know, you had it in a case study or you read it about it in Fortune magazine or, hey, I did this in, in my last company and we had a huge success with it. Um, so that, sir, that that passes for knowing, you know, and then you what you want to do is what they want to do. If you're a traditional thinker is to move directly into doing right. So um, you have this confidence that it's it worked before. It's going to work again. So let's move right into it. Um, however, because it is it is risky, you tend to sort of pull back on what you do. You don't take a big chance. And in fact, you're working with old information because if you're dealing with case studies and stuff you learned in school and something you read in a magazine, it's it, it could be outdated. It could be just the wrong answer for the current problem that you have. Um, so there's difficulties with it. And so what you do is you kind of play it safe. And then where are you? You have a solution, a direction to go that is – not very bold uh, and certainly not very innovative. So how do you innovate with confidence so that you you can de-risk it uh, to a certain point? So that's where design thinking comes in. It adds a step in the middle. So instead of just moving right from knowing to doing, you put in a step of making. So you go, you you know something and then you you imagine some options that weren't on the table before so you you use you apply your imagination and prototype something put it on the table and and that changes your understanding of what's possible so um it, it changes what you do but it also changes what you know and it makes it seem a bit safer for going forward then you have something you can test and uh, that's how you have to do innovation you have to prototype things and test them and Design thinking is all wound around that goal. This episode of How Brands Are Built is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how Squad Help works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And Squad Help doesn't just do naming. You can also use their platform for taglines or slogans, as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. One of the central tenets of brand strategy is that brands should stand for a single focused idea. What do you call that? What kind of terminology are you using these days? Is it a brand position or positioning, or do you use something else usually? No, it's positioning. Just okay. go straight back to Trout and Reese. You know, mm-hmm. the, right. their book, their books are beautiful. I mean, yeah. the positioning book that came out and was a little booklet when it first came out in 1970, just like a little pamphlet, mm-hmm. um, is is beautiful and true. So um, I, I'm fine with the word positioning, but I take it a little further in my work because I think you can have a position that's not compelling. It's a position and you can own it, but it's not inspiring, cares. maybe. Right. And typically it's because it's either off target or it's not bold enough. And so, you know, the whole thing about branding is to be different. It's, uh, you know, don't get, don't get good at something, get different. Different is very powerful. So I call it a zag. zag I I was going to say, it's one of the only book titles (laughs) that is also a piece of advice for branding. (laughs) I can't think of any other uh, books where you can just look at the title and and get a lot of the advice out of the book. You you were just speaking to um, the the idea of brand positioning, maybe not being sometimes not being compelling or, or inspiring or lofty enough. Is that where you get to this idea of purpose that I've seen you write about? Purpose is really the existential part of this whole whole branding thing. It's it's at the very top of the strategic pyramid. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know why are we in business beyond making money? Uh, this is a question that a lot of companies didn't even dare ask themselves 20, 30 years ago because they were they were so afraid of alienating their shareholders. So right. they always thought our purpose is to make our shareholders rich. <laughs> 
Still, uh, still well, a lot of companies are doing that. There's a lot of that. Yeah. But, you know, they're not going to get rich without customers. So let's and, and who's going to want to join that company? <laughs> you know, right. how are you going to attract talent with that as your your main goal? So purpose is um, usually lofty. You know, it's something about changing the world. And there are these other terms like brand essence. And, and what you just said reminds me of that. Simon Sinek golden circle where he talks about it's not what you do, it's why you do it. What do you make of all these different kind of buzzwords that are out there? Are, are they all just different ways of saying the same thing or do you distinguish between them? I think they're, um, yeah, they're, they're just different ways, different flavors of the same mm -hmm. thing. I, I hardly ever see something that's stunningly different or really <laughs> wrong. I just try to take these ideas and um, uh, create a, a standardized language for them. I've even put out a dictionary to help that along, uh, brand A to Z. Yep, and I use some of your definitions when I when I teach brand strategy. So thank you for okay. that. So yeah. speaking of purpose statements, the Big Sky team writes a purpose statement in the book to democratize life enhancing travel. Yeah. Is that? Is that a good purpose statement? And if so, why? And, you know, what, what does it help them achieve in the book? Yeah, it's not exciting, but it's it's true for them. So mm -hmm. um, democratizing travel, <clears throat> when they finally realized that's what they were doing, then they had to question how they were doing it because they realized they weren't doing a good job of, of that thing that they want to do. Um, democratizing travel, uh, they realized means that they have to make it affordable for people. They have to get more people in, more people that normally couldn't travel or wouldn't travel or were afraid to travel, couldn't afford it. Uh, how do they um, bring them into the fold uh, so they can achieve their purpose? And so that's the answer, which I won't reveal, is <laughs> does that. They have to think about that really hard. The, the CEO is troubled by this because he realizes they're not actually doing what they, they've set out to do. Right. So it gets them focused and it expands their thinking of what's possible. Exactly. You, you mentioned your strategy pyramid a second ago with purpose at the top and then mission and vision below that and short term goals kind of at the bottom of the pyramid. Is that your model of a, a comprehensive brand strategy platform or I don't know if that's the term you would use? Um, yes, but it's not completely original. It's drawn from a lot of uh, different sources. But mm -hmm. but if I were to average them all out and make sense out of them, which to me, they don't always make sense. <laughs> the terms are always mixed up. Somebody, some people put mission at the top or they put vision at the top and purpose isn't even there. Right. Where do things like brand personality, brand values, brand pillars, if if those do fit in at all in, in your um, formulation of of a brand platform, are those separate or are they contained somehow in that strategy pyramid? You know, we use we use the pillar idea sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but I, I tend to use something called the brand commitment matrix that um, is the centerpiece of uh, my my last so far my last uh, whiteboard overview called the brand flip, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's turned out to be really useful. And it 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 has six um, spaces in it, six things you have to fill in, and two columns of three each side by side. And on one side, I know you have to use your imagination to picture this, but <laughs> in one column, it's customers. And on the other column right next to it, it's company. And there's uh, three pairs of things that have to align. So at the top of this matrix is customer identity. Uh, who are they? Who's that customer that you want? What are you going to, um, what are you going to do for them? How are you going to make their lives better? What do you want them to become? as a result of you being in the world and across from that is company purpose. And that should be pretty much related to that. So that's why you exist beyond making money. Mm -hmm. uh, those should relate. And then below that, th those things don't have to be, uh, you don't have to own those. They don't have to be differentiated at all. I mean, you can have the same purpose as your competitors. Um, the main thing is that you have a purpose and it's an honest, authentic purpose. And it gets you up in the morning, gets you to work and, and, inspires the keep, employees and yeah inspires you to go get over the hurdles and stuff so below that though you need to now be specific if you want to compete in the world and so you have to think about um, customer aims those are the jobs that they're trying to get done the benefits that they need so it's what they want so across from what they want is what we offer and that's 
what I'm calling onlyness. And that's that's your zag. So you, mm-hmm. you asked what would I call that? It's onlyness. We're the only blank that blanks. And that onlyness needs to be super simple, compelling. It has to be something that everyone can see and agree to, and that no one else could or would want to claim. So uh, that's that's a very high bar. But right. to me, that's where you have to start to have a really bold brand, a really strong one, is you have to have some sort of onlyness. And then below that, sort of at the foundational level, is uh, customer mores, uh, which is how they belong, the tribe that they belong to, how they belong to that tribe of people. So if you don't have a tribe, you don't really have uh, a customer base because you need people that – sort of think the same way, act the same way, talk to each other, that can spread the word, all that. So what's an example of, of that, of the, the tribe concept? Oh, a really strong tribe would be like uh, Harley Davidson. You mm-hmm. know, There's a, a real strong tribal belonging in that. And, th- and there are all kinds of rules. Like, you know, a, a woman might ride a motorcycle, but she's not going to be sitting in back of a man, or she's not going to be driving and the man sits in back of her, right? Because she's <laughs> going to have her own motorcycle, or sit in the back. Is that an that's, unspoken that's, rule or an it's actual unspoken, rule? But, okay. but if you if you violate it, everyone will say, oh, that would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> so those kinds of things you have to be aware of. And those, so those customer mores um, have to align with company values. So the values of the company need to be pretty much the same as the, as the values of the customers because they're going to find out what they are. They're going to experience them. They're going to read about them. So you have to have those three things. And when you got those locked together, now you have a filter for all your decisions going forward, a very simple filter and a, a platform to, to, to create touch points and experiences for customers. And the simpler, the better. So that's why I only have these six and they're expressed very simply. And the process that you would recommend for populating those six boxes, is it is it a somewhat standardized process of immersion? Maybe you do in-depth interviews or um, quantitative research, and then you go through rounds of recommendation and revision? Or, or how do you how do you get to the words that go into those boxes? It can just be two days with hardly any uh, research at all because you're making you're, you know, you're deciding in advance what customers you want. And you have some ideas about how you're going to do that. So it can be simpler and rougher. But for companies that have a lot more at stake, larger companies, then then I would suggest the full Marty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the full uh, Marty. We, you know, and this is this is where I can't do this by myself. Um, so liquid brings in a team of people to to do research and you know market research customer research they'll they'll come up with often three uh, positioning territories uh-huh. you know that occurred to them um they aren't set in so stone but they're at least direction that we could sort of test out um and then when we then it's two days of um exercises and working through these items and then um if uh, if liquid is actually going to go further with this, then a, a really interesting way of doing this is to s- stay for another three days and prototype in rapid speed, prototype some of the key touch points for the brand so that you actually can see how this would play out. And the executives can say, oh, I see. I can see where this is going. This is awesome. Or, right. you know, this is might not work. Why don't we back up and try something else? And you do this on the fly and everybody's working at the same time. You don't do it in, in a linear order at this stage. You're you're researching, you're designing, you're strategizing, you're copywriting on the fly and everybody's learning from everybody else. So it's this chaotic, hectic process that ends up brilliant at the end. I mean, it's just amazing how much you can accomplish. And and at that point, there's no more selling for the um, the consulting firm because the the executives are there the whole time. They're right, you get them so, excited about the the touch points that you've prototyped, and and they're the ones pushing you to get there. Yeah, and and they can see it in a week. And we're back at agile strategy. So so now we see how these things kind of sync with one another. A couple of wrap up questions. Um, you've written some of the most popular books on brand out there. And I'm just curious, what are some of your favorite books, whether they inspired you to start writing or things that you've read recently about branding that that you would recommend? Oh, that's a good question. Um, lots of them. I, I, I haven't read everything and I tend not to read books that are too close to what I already do. So some 
some of the people that were, you know, my fellow travelers, I don't <laughs> always read their books. I kind of know what they're, you know, I get the sense of what they're about and I just, I don't have time to read them all. So I read things that are a little bit, um, go a level below or, you know, a little bit deeper or add some knowledge that I need. So I think when you said that I first flashed on the book that made me try to do this whiteboard overview thing, which is a book, uh, came out in the sixties. I'm sure nobody has it or remembers it, but at the time when I was in art school, this was like a, just a mind blower. Uh, it's, it was based on Marshall McLuhan's the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. uh, an art director called Quentin Fior took his ideas and then working with Marshall McLuhan simplified them into a really simple, uh, illustrated book that was about a quarter inch thick called the message. Uh, the medium is the massage, the massage. Um, <laughs> and it, um, and it used all these great, great photographs of the, you know, f you know, f journalistic photographs of the time and diagrams, and all kinds of stuff. It was graphically really arresting and very sixties kind of hip sixties. Um, and I just thought it was like, that really spoke to me and I really could, understand that much easier than reading the full Marshall McLuhan book. I totally got it because it just brought it down to its essence. So that, that book was really, um, essential for me. I think I got a lot out of reading, um, confessions of an advertising man way mm -hmm. back when David, David Ogilvy. Ogilvy. uh, just cause he's so smart and erudite. Um, I was really impressed with the possibilities of talking about advertising and design. Let's see what else. Oh, well, the J Trout and Reese, that, those oh. were the ones that really set me off on this path. And I realized they were completely right, but they were leaving out the part that I did and all my, my part of the profession, which is the execution, the, you know, the touch points, the, uh, all the communication of, of the strategy. Right. So aside from books, as, as one of the most successful brand thinkers out there, um, what advice do you give young brand strategists or designers that are interested in becoming successful brand consultants? I think of a, something that happened to me when I was a young designer, mm -hmm. designer and a writer way back when. I, I, I started to get some attention for my work and I got invited to things, you know, to judge competitions. And I got invited to um, a poster, international poster biennial. So it was full of people like, sort of the older graphic designers from the period before these, the greats of graphic design coming from all over the world, um, for an exhibit of their posters. And my, one of mine got chosen. So I was in this group of people and I just looked around and there's all these people I'd always wanted to meet. And, uh, one of them was, um, an art director of the first great design magazine, um, international magazine called Graphis, or in Europe, it's called Graphis. And so I, I met one of the early art directors of Graphis, and uh, I, we had a conversation, and he says, look, I'm going to give you some advice. <laughs> I didn't ask for it. He just had to give it to me. Uh, I said, okay, uh, wh what is it? He goes, well, I first have to ask you. He's a Swiss guy. He says, I first, I first have to ask you, um, is your desk against the wall, or is it out in the open? I said, well, it's, it's out in the open. He goes, well, that's good. I said, okay. <laughs> he says, uh, well, here's what you do. Here's my advice. When you're finished with your, your design, walk around to the other side of your desk. I said, and? He goes, no, that's it. That's it. And I, I just, a big smile crept across my face because I realized what he was trying to tell me. It was a metaphor. So he says, you know, look at your work from the other side. Mm -hmm. From the customer's point of view. From the customer's point of view. And that stuck with me. And that eventually led to the brand gap because I realized, you know, you got to, it's not what you say it is. It's what they say it is. The brand belongs to customers. They decide what the brand, it's your reputation. And they, they decide what it is. And you can affect that reputation by what you do, how you behave and what, what materials you share with them, what the products do and all that kind of stuff. But Ultimately, they decide. So you have to start with that and work backwards. Wow. So that little enigmatic piece of advice of walking around to the other side of the desk led to the brand gap and the brand gap really led to everything else, it seems like, from the outside looking in. Yep. That's that's the story. All right. Great. Well, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Marty, for making the time to join me. Thank you, Rob. It was a pleasure. 
Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. If you like this episode, please leave a review and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about Marty, visit martynewmeyer.com. That's Marty, N-E-U-M-E-I-E-R.com. Check out some of the free resources on his site, and while you're there, sign up for his newsletter. Scramble is available on Amazon as a physical book, an ebook, or an audiobook. But Marty also shared a special link you can go to for what I'd call the collector's edition of Scramble. If you visit 800ceoread.com and type Scramble into the search bar, you can find a high quality paperback version of the book with an embossed cover and French folds. It's the version he sent me and it's really nice. And best of all, if you buy two or more copies, you get a 40% discount. Again, that's 800ceoreads.com type scramble into the search bar. For more on how brands are built, you can visit us online at howbrandsarebuilt.com or hbab.co, where you can check out show notes, articles, and blog posts, sign up for our newsletter, and find all our social media profiles. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time.